hello everyone, I'm Matthew, and this is my colleague Colleen. And today we're going to be going over uh, what's new with the Android runtime on Android, also known as Art. So, what is Art? Well, Art is the software layer in between the applications and the operating system. It provides uh, mechanisms for executing Java language and call-in applications. To accomplish this, Art does two things. It executes DEX files, the intermediate representation of Android applications, through a hybrid model consisting of uh, interpretation, uh, just-in-time compilation, and profile-based ahead-of-time compilation. Art also does memory management for Android applications through an automatic, uh, automatic reclamation through a garbage collector. This is a concurrent compacting garbage collector so that there is less jank for your applications. Now, let's look at how Art has changed over the last few years. Over the years, there have been many improvements to Art. In Nougat, we introduced a profile-guided compilation to improve application startup time, reduce memory usage, and reduce storage requirements. Also in Nougat, we added a a JIT, much like Dalvik used to have. This was done to remove the need for optimizing apps. That was uh, kind of a big problem during Android system updates. And in Oreo, we added a new concurrent compacting garbage collector to reduce RAM requirements, have less jank, as well as accelerate allocations. As you can see here on the slide, this new garbage collector enabled a new uh, bump pointer allocator that is uh, 17 times faster than the allocator in Dalvik, or in KitKat. Now, we talked about what happened in the past, but what's new in Android P? First of all, there are new compiler optimizations to help accelerate the performance of call-in code in Android. This is especially important since call-in is the first class programming language for Android development, Next up, we have memory and storage optimizations to help entry-level devices, such as Android Go devices. This is important to help improve the performance for the next billion users. And finally, we have cloud profiles. Device-collected profiles from the just-in-time compiler are uploaded and aggregated in the cloud to enable faster performance directly after installation of applications. OK, so let's start with Colin. Last year, we announced Colin as a first class officially supported programming language for Android development, and then we began to investigate the performance. Why Colin, you might ask? Well, Colin is a safe, expressive, concise, object oriented language that is uh, designed to be interoperable with Java language. The reason uh, Art focuses on optimizing Colin so that the developers can leverage all of these language features while still having fast and jank-free applications. Let's see how call-in optimizations are normally performed inside of the Android runtime. Usually, optimizations are performed in an investigative manner, and there's an order of preference for fixing performance issues so that the most amount of call-in applications can actually benefit from the optimization. The preferred option is fixing a performance issue inside of CallLink, and CallLink is the compiler developed by JetBrains. Uh, Google and JetBrains, of course, work closely together on all kinds of optimizations and fixes for issues. If we fix a performance issue here, it'll be able to be deployed to the most amount of call-in applications. Alternatively, if that doesn't work, then we consider fixing the performance issue inside of bytecode converters. Fixing in the bytecode converter will enable existing versions of the Android platform to get the performance fixed. And if that option doesn't work, the last option is to fix the performance issue in the Android runtime, also known as Art. Uh, so the reason that uh, we might not want to fix an Art right away is because Art is updated as part of the Android platform. So that means that not all devices will get the fix. Now, let's look at an example. 
One example of the call-in optimization is the parameter null check. As you can see here, this is a simple method that just returns the length of a string, but the string is uh, nullable. So what this means is that the compiler inserts a null check into the function uh, bytecode to actually verify that the string is not null and throw the corresponding exception if required. Implemented in the bytecode, the first step is loading the name of the parameter and then invoking a separate function to do the actual null check. So there's some extra overhead here, as you might see, because the invocation, in the common case, you do the extra invocation that goes to the function to do the null check. And this function, in turns, if required, calls the third function to throw the actual uh, parameter is null exception. Checks such as these are commonly required for Java language and call it interoperability, because Java language does not have a non-nullable property. Now, let's see how we can optimize this. If we look at the bytecode, one of the first things we can do is actually inline the method that does the null check into the caller. After inlining, uh, this improves performance because there's one less invocation. And from here, you can see one other thing we can do is that the, the name of the parameter is not actually required unless uh, the argument is null. So from here, we can do code syncing to move loading of the parameter name inside of the conditional. So overall, these two optimizations help performance by removing one invocation and one uh, loadings of a string literal. Apart from this optimization, we also track call-in performance on various benchmarks. Uh, other improvements here include uh, improved auto-vectorization of loops, uh, also intrinsic methods that are specifically uh, tailored for call-in code to help improve performance there. So the R team is always working on improving this performance. OK, now that we're done calling, what about memory and storage improvements? So since Art is responsible for Java language and call-in applications, it's also pretty important to just kind of make sure that the programs don't use too much memory and take too much space on a device. There have been several improvements focusing on this area, including reducing the amount of space and memory usage required by DEX files. Now, why are RAM and storage, import, uh, and, uh, storage optimizations important? Well, recall that last year, we introduced a new initiative called Android Go, aiming at running the latest versions of Android on entry-level devices. Since these devices typically have one gigabyte or less of RAM and eight gigabytes or, or less of storage, it's kind of important to focus on optimizing these areas so that the users can run enough applications and install as many applications as they, or more applications than they would, they would otherwise be able to. Now, this isn't just for Android Go. Premium devices also benefit from optimizations in these two areas, but since they have more resources, normally it's to a lesser degree. Anyways, before we talk about uh, RAM and storage optimizations, let's do a little bit of a review about how applications work on your Android devices. An application normally comes in an application package kit, also known as an APK. Inside of the APK, there are usually one or more Dalvik executable files, also known as DEX files, that contain instructions that Art uses to either interpret or compile your application. Since DEX files are required to be quickly accessed during execution, they are mapped directly into memory during application startup uh, so that Art can have quick access. This means that this, there is a startup cost as well as a RAM cost proportional to the size of the DEX file. Finally, DEX files are usually stored twice on the device. The first place they are stored is inside of the application package kit, and then the second place they are stored is in an extracted form so that Art can have faster access during application startup without needing to extract from the zip file each time. Now, let's take a closer look at the contents of DEX files. Within a DEX file, there are several sections containing different types of data related to the applications. But how, where is the space going in the DEX file? One way to do this is you can kind of calculate where the space is going for each DEX file and average out the results. This chart here is for the top 99 most downloaded applications in the Play Store. And you can see that the largest section is the code atom section containing the DEX instructions used by Art. The next largest section is the string data section, 
And this section contains the string literals loaded from code, method names, class names, and field names. Combined, these two sections are around 64% uh, of the DEX file, so they're pretty important areas to optimize. Let's see if there's a way we can reduce the size of these sections. One new feature introduced in Android P is called Compact DEX. The goal of Compact DEX is simple. Reduce the size of DEX files to get memory and storage savings on the device. From the previous slide, we saw that some sections are larger than others. So it's important to just focus on the large sections to get the most savings. For the code items, uh, they are more often deduplicated, and they also have their headers shrunk to save the, uh, space for each method, essentially, inside of the application. And another thing here worth noting about the string data is that large applications frequently ship multiple DEX files in their APK because of DEX format limitations. Uh, specifically, the 64K method limit means that you can only have 64,000 kind of method references in a single DEX file before needing to add another one to your application. And every time you add another DEX file, this causes duplication specifically of string data that could otherwise be stored only once. Compact DEX shrinks this by providing deduplication across the DEX files in the APK. Now, let's go to the generation process. First, let's look at how DEX files are processed on Android Oreo. The first step run by dex to oat the ahead of time compiler, is that the DEX files are extracted from the APK and stored in a VDEX container. The reason they are extracted, as I mentioned earlier, is so that they can be loaded more efficiently during application startup. One other thing here worth noting is the profile. So the profile, as introduced in NuGot, is uh, essentially data about the application execution, including which methods are executed during startup, what methods are hot, so compiled by the JIT compiler, and what classes are loaded. On Oreo, we are we're already optimizing the DEX files stored in the VDEX container by la applying layout optimizations. And also, we were deciding which methods to compile based on what methods are hot in the DEX file. Now, let's look at DEX processing on Android P. In Android P, the ahead of time compiler now converts the DEX files to a more efficient compact DEX uh, representation inside of the container. One new addition here is the introduction of a shared data section. Specifically, data that's present in multiple DEX files will be in the shared data section only once, so it kind of deduplicates uh, data that's commonly shared. And one of the most commonly shared things here is the string data. So this is how we reduce the large uh, string data section that we saw earlier. Finally, since the conversion is automatically done on device, this means that all existing applications can get the benefits of Compact Dex without needing to recompile their APKs. OK, so let's look at one example of how we actually shrink the Dex code items. Apart from the instructions, each code item has a 16-byte header. And then most of the values in the header are usually small values. So what we do here is we shrink the fields in the header to be four bits each, and then we have an optional preheader to extend them as required. The preheader is zero bytes in most of the cases, but can be up to 12 bytes in the worst case. So other than the preheader, we also shrink the instruction count. Since uh, the average method is not going to be that large, we shrink this down to 11 bits instead of 32 bits, and we use the five remaining bits for uh, flags that are art specific. Finally, we move the debug information into a separate space-efficient table to help enable more deduplication of the code items. Overall, this optimization saves around 12 bytes per code item uh, in the compact DEX file. And here are the results for the top 99 most downloaded APKs. So the average uh, space required by the DEX files on a device is around 11.6% smaller. And then also, other than the storage savings, we also get memory savings because the, the DEX files are resident in memory during application usage, at least partially resident in memory. And one more thing here. Let's go over the layout optimizations a little bit. So even though we had introduced the JIT profiles in Android N, we did not have any layout optimizations back then. 
So what this means is the DEX is kind of randomly ordered and not uh, disregarding the usage pattern. In Android O, we added this type of layout optimization that groups the methods used during application startup together and the methods that are hot, so that means their code is frequently accessed during execution together. Uh, this seems like a pretty, good a pretty big uh, win so far. But let's see what we did for Android P. In Android P, we have more flexible uh, profile information, which enables us to put the methods that are used only during startup together. This helps reduce the amount of memory used because the application or the operating system can remove those pages from memory after startup. We also put the hot code together since it's frequently accessed during execution. And finally, we put the code that just never touched at all during execution at the end so that it's not loaded into memory unless required. And the reason that these layout optimizations are important is because they improve locality and reduce how many parts of the DEX file are actually loaded uh, into memory during application usage and startup. So if you improve the locality here, you can get startup benefits, uh, memory reduction, uh, and a reduction in memory usage. And now, to Colleen for Cloud Profiles. Thank you, Matthew. Hello, everyone. My name is Colleen. And I'm here today to present you how we plan to improve and scale up the Android runtime profiling infrastructure. However, before we start, profiling is a rather overloaded term. When we will speak about profiling in today's presentation, we're going to refer to the metadata that the Android runtime captures about the application execution, metadata that we're going to be feed into a profile-guided optimization process. We're going to see how we extend the on-device capabilities in order to drive performance right at install time. Before we jump into what is new and how actually it works, let me briefly remind you how Android uses profile-guided optimizations. This is an efficient technique that we introduced in Android Nougat as part of a hybrid execution model. Hybrid means that the code being executed can be in three different optimization states at the same time. The primary goal of this technique is to improve all key metrics of the application performance. We're talking about faster application startup time, reduced memory footprint, a better user experience by providing less junk during usage, less disk space used by the compiler artifacts, which means more disk space for our users, and nonetheless, an increased battery life, because we do heavy optimizations when the device is not used rather than at the use time. How does this work? It all starts when the Play Store installs the application. But first, we do very, very light optimizations, and we have the application ready to go for the user. At first launch, the application will start in what we call an interpretation mode. As the runtime executes the application code, it discovers the most frequently used methods and the most important methods to be optimized. That's when a JIT system can, kicks in and will optimize that code. During this time, the JIT system also records what we call a profile information. This profile information essentially encapsulates data about the methods that are being executed and about the classes that are being loaded. Every now and then, we dump this profile to disk so that we can reuse it later. Once the device is put aside and is not in use, a state which we call idle maintenance mode, we're going to use that profile to drive profile-guided optimizations. The result is an optimized app which will eventually replace the original state. Now, when the user relaunches the app, it will have a much snappier startup time, a much better steady state performance execution. And overall, the battery will drain less. In this state, the application will be interpreted, just in time compiled, or pre-optimized. Now, just how efficient is this technique? We gather some data from the field for Google Maps application. Here you can see two charts. The left one presents data from a Marshmallow build. You can see that the startup time is pretty constant over time. It does not fluctuate. 
And this is pretty much expected. You don't want to have the deviations here. However, on the right-hand side, you can see that in Nougat, the startup time drops over time. Eventually, it stabilizes of being about 25% faster than it used to be at install time. And this is great news. It means that the more the user uses the app, the more we can optimize it. And over time, the performance gets better and better. This is great, but we can do better, and we want to do better. There shouldn't be need, we shouldn't need to wait for optimal performance. And our goal with Cloud Profiles is to deliver near optimal performance right after install time, without having to wait for the application to be profiled. So let's see how, it's going to, how this is going to work. Let me introduce you the idea of Cloud Profiles. This is based on main two key observations. First one is that usually apps have many commonly used code paths that are shared between a multitude of users and devices. Take, for example, classes loading during startup time. Each device will have its own specific set. However, globally, we can extract a common intersection of all those classes. And that's valuable data for us to optimize upon. Second, we know that most app developers roll out their apps incrementally, starting with alpha beta channels, or for example, one, two percent of their user base. And the idea behind Cloud Profiles is to use this initial set of alpha beta channel users to bootstrap performance for the rest of the users. So how is it going to work? Once we have an initial set of devices, we're going to extract the profile information about your APK from those devices. We're going to upload that information to play, and there we're going to combine everything. We're going to aggregate whatever comes in, and we're going to generate what we call a core application profile. This core profile will contain information which is relevant across all device executions and not just a single one. When a new device requests for that application to be installed, we're going to deliver this core profile alongside the main application APK to the device. Locally, the device will be able to use that data to perform profile-guided optimizations right at install time. That will deliver an improved cold startup performance and much better steady-state performance over time. Now, having profiles in the cloud offers much more opportunities than directly influencing the app performance with profile-guided optimizations. The core profiles offers valuable data, for example, for developers to act upon. And we believe there is enough information there so that developers can tune their own applications. We're going to explore how we can share this data later. Now, you can see in this workflow that to deliver such a thing, we need support from Android platform and Play alike. In today's presentation, we're going to focus on the Android support. So what did we do in P to support this lifecycle? We added new interfaces that will allow us to extract the profile and bootstrap the information from the cloud. The functionality is available to all system-level apps, which acquire the necessary permissions. And in our case, Play is just a consumer. The two AP APIs I'm talking about are profile extractions, and these are exposed via a new platform manager we call it Art Manager. The second API is Profile Installation. And this is seemingly integrated in the current installer session. What we did here is to add a new kind of installation artifact that the platform understands. We call this Dex Metadata Files. Essentially, in a similar way to the APKs, the Dex Metadata Files are archives which will contain information in how the runtime can optimize the application. Initially, these Dex metadata files will contain the core profile that I mentioned about earlier. 
but install time, Play will deliver these files, if they are available, to the device, where they will be streamlined into the Dex optimizer on device. It is worthwhile mentioning that we will offer support for Google Play dynamic delivery. So if you plan to split the functionality of your application in different APKs, all the APKs will have their own text metadata files. So let's take a look how everything fits together from the device perspective. You remember that I presented this diagram in the beginning, showing how the profiling works locally. Let's focus here just on the profile file and on the application. Once we, will be able, once we manage to capture a profile file, we're going to upstrip this information to play. On play, as I mentioned, we'll aggregate this data with many, many other profiles. And when we have a core profiles, we're going to deliver it to our new users as a core profile. The idea of the core profile is not to replace on-device profiling. It's only to bootstrap the profile optimizations. So essentially, instead of starting with a completely blank state about your application, we we'll already know what are the most commonly executed code paths, and we'll be able to start the optimizations from there. So now, essentially, what was a pure on-device profile feedback loop, it gets extended with a cloud component. Now, I keep talking about this core profile, and I think it's important to dedicate a bit more attention to it. So let's talk a bit how we're going to build it. We already know that on device, from one execution to the other, the profiles aggregate quite well. They reach a stable point pretty fast. That means that we will not re-optimize the application over and over and over again. After a few optimization steps, we will stop. However, that's data from one device. How well does this work when you try to do it cross devices? How many samples you would need in order to get to a robust, reliable profile? We looked at our own Google applications, and we tried to figure that out. Here you can see a plot which represents the amount of information in the core profiles relative to the total number of aggregations. The y-axis represents the amount of information, and the actual value, numeric value, is not important there. What is important from this graph is that actually from 20, 20 30 kind of uh, prof number of profile aggregations, the information in the profile reaches a plateau. And that's very important. It sends a very important message. It means that the alpha, beta channel users will provide us with enough data to build a core profile. And it means that the majority of the production users of your application will always have the best possible experience. So how do we actually aggregate the information? I mentioned before that in the profile, you will find information about classes and methods. On device, this is roughly how it looks like. We're going to take all the executions that we have seen before, and we'll create a union of everything that we've seen. In the aggregated profile, you will have information about classes, methods, about everything that you've seen. On cloud, however, we don't really want everything. We only want the commonly executed code paths. And what we are doing, instead of having a union, we'll ha be having a smart intersection. We'll be only keeping the information relevant to all executions, meaning we're going to filter out all the outliers. The result is what we call the core profile, which only keeps the most commonly seen samples. And this is what's going to get eventually to the device. How well does this work? Let's look again at data captured from Google Apps. We tested this across a variety of applications, and here are the results of some representative ones. 
In this set, you can find application which relies on native code, for example, Google Camera, or applications which, have much, which are much more Java-oriented, say, Google Maps or Google Docs. For Google Camera, for example, you get a startup time improvement of about 12.6%. And that's excellent, given that the application itself doesn't have a lot of Java code. However, for Maps or Docs, which are heavily Java-based, you can see that the optimizations improves the startup time by about 28% or 33%. Across the board, you can see an average of about 20% improvement. And that obviously depends on what the application is doing, how much Java code is being used, and so on. Now, I mentioned in the beginning that besides improving the application performance directly via profile-guided optimizations, the profile also offer much more opportunities. I'm going to present a short use case study and walk you through some important aspects that the profiles can reveal about your application. During this use case study, I'm going to focus on a single question. Are you shipping unnecessary code to the clients? Are you? Let's take a look at some data. Again, this uh, case study reflects the state of uh, some Google apps that we tested. We see that on average, we profile about 14, 15% of the code, and about 85% of the code remains unprofiled. When you spread the distribution, you can see, for example, that in some apps, 5 to 10% of the code gets profiled. In some other apps, even 50% of the code gets profiled. And this is a rather intriguing result. And the reason for that is that if the code is not profiled, that most likely means that it might not have ever been executed. Obviously, that's uh, for a good case. I mean, the code, for example, can be unexpected error code pass, right? We all want the applications to be reliable and robust, and the error handling must be there. Hopefully, it never gets executed. You may have backwards compatibility code, support for previous API level and such. You may have features which are not used on all devices. You may have very, uh, features very targeted. And you might also have a lot of unnecessary code lying around maybe by including libraries that you don't really use. Now, it's a bit hard to break down the percentage for this, these categories, and there can be other reasons why we didn't profile the code. But the skewed distribution here is a strong indication that there is a lot of room to be impro of improvements for our APK. The code can be reorganized or trimmed down for better efficiency. For example, Google Play introduced dynamic delivery schemes, which may help you reduce the code that you share by targeting features only to certain users. And that's something that you might want to look at and take advantage of. So we believe that there is a, quite a bit of unnecessary code lying around, at least in our own APKs. Now, since we focus on the, prof on the code that actually doesn't get profiled, Okay, is there anything that we can extract out of the profile code? To understand this, let me talk a bit about different categories of profile code. When the application code is being profiled, the runtime will try to label it depending on its state. And you will have a label for the startup category, for the post-startup category, and for the hot category. Obviously, these are pretty safe explanatory. The hot category of the code is essentially what the runtime seen to be the most important part of your code. It's important to keep in mind that these are not disjoint. Say, for example, that a method foo is being executed. This can be executing during startup, can be executing during post-startup time, and can also be marked as hot. For example, if you have a very heavy computation during that method. Now, if you know the code which is executing during startup time, if you focus on that, you'll be able to lower the startup time of the application. As such, the first impression that the users will have upon your application will be very good. 
if you look at the post startup code, that will help you, for example, lay out the application vexed by code. That will lead to memory improvements and will be much smoother on low end devices. As for the hot code, this is the code that should get the most attention for your optimizations efforts. It's the code that is most heavily optimized by the runtime. And it might be so because the runtime identify that it will be very beneficial to invest time there. And it's what, if you, for example, start to try to improve the quality and the performance of your app, this is where you should spend your effort or your initial effort. Now, for this, it's important like how much code of your application is actually being marked as hot. Because if everything is hot, then everything can be optimized. So that's not really, not really useful. Let me show you the breakdown of these three categories. In this graph, you can see on the red columns the percentages for the profile code and the not profile code. This will sum up to 100%, and it's what I showed you earlier. They are here just for the reference. The blue boxes show the percentages of the startup code, the post-startup code, and the hot one relative to the total DEX by code. So don't expect it to add 100%. Also, one, part, one piece of code can be in different categories at the same time. As you can see here, the average, on average, about 10% of the application DEX by code is being marked as hot. And this indicates that when you focus on your app optimizations, you can dedicate the attention only starting with just a small part of your application code base. You can obviously you should spend time on all the other parts as well. But probably this is where you should start from. Let me go over a quick review of what we presented today and the main benefits. We started with Kotlin, and we described a few new compiler optimizations that we added that focus on Kotlin performance. We described briefly how we approach Kotlin optimizations, and that we first try to seek improvements in the Kotlin compiler. We moved to memory and storage optimizations, and my colleague Matthews introduced you to the concept of compact DEX. This is a new DEX format available just on device, and we will fo which focuses on the memory savings. And finally, I presented you the idea of cloud profiles. And we talk about how we can bootstrap the profile-guided optimizations using a small percentage of alpha, beta channel users in order to lead important performance improvement right after install time for the majority of the production users. With this, I'd like to thank you for your attention and for your presence. And I want to invite you all to Android Runtime Office Hours tomorrow, where we can answer any questions that you have about today's presentation or about the runtime in general. We're going to be at, set at half past five in section A. Thank you so much.